If you have just purchased or upgraded to the DJI Mini 4 Pro, there are a few settings you will want to be aware of when you first start using the drone to make sure you get the best possible experience when flying it, but also to get the highest quality videos and images possible. In this video, I'm going to go through them settings, explain what they do and why you should change them. Let's jump right in. Now, if you're new around here, welcome to The Drone Creative, the channel that helps you learn more about flying drones from the basics to the most advanced techniques to help you get more cinematic videos and better images from your drone. So if you would like to see more of that, then please consider subscribing by clicking that subscribe button down below. And when you're down there, make sure to check that notification bell so that you will be alerted when my new videos are released. It would be greatly appreciated. And let's dive right in to the first setting. Now the first setting is actually a device management setting and it's a setting called value added service. Now the reason why this is a very important setting Setting to set, especially the first time you fly your drone, is because it will make sure that you get the full DJI Care Refresh coverage. So if you purchase DJI Care Refresh, which is DJI's version of insurance, to make sure that you get flyaway coverage, you must bind the controller to the drone. And you do that in the value added service setting. So to get to this setting, you want to press the profile button from the controller's home screen, go to device management, and then on the left side, you will see an option called value add service. And you want to press this. Now to bind your controller to your drone, you now want to press Press this bind new device button. You want to confirm the details on the screen, so make sure this is your DJI account email which is showing. And then you want to press the confirm button. And then after a few seconds, you will see binding successful. And this will have now validated your DJI Care flyaway coverage to make sure you're getting the full protection. Now the next setting that's really useful to know about is the advanced return to home setting. And you can access this by going to the settings menu by tapping the three white dots on the top right of the controller screen. And then under the safety tab, if you scroll down, you will see the advanced return to home setting. And in here you have two options, optimal and preset. And this changes what the drone does when it's flying back to you if return to home is engaged. Now, return to home might engage automatically if you lose signal between the controller and the drone, or if the drone has a critically low battery, or you can manually engage return to home by pressing and holding the return to home button on the controller. Now, if this setting is set to preset, the drone will rise up to a preset altitude when return to home is engaged, fly back to above its home point, and then automatically lower and land. And that preset altitude that the drone rises up to can be set under the auto return to home altitude setting, which is just below the advanced return to home setting. So here you can see it's set to 100 meters. So that means when return to home is engaged, the drone will rise up to 100 meters. But we have a second option under advanced return to home called optimal. Now in optimal mode, instead of the drone rising up to a preset altitude, when return to home is engaged, the drone will automatically work out an altitude that it deems is safe enough to fly over any obstacles as it comes back to you. And it can adjust this as it's flying back to you while bypassing them obstacles. And this means that in general, it's not going to fly up to a very, very high altitude. Now this can be beneficial because one of the main reasons you will see return to home engage whenever you're flying your drone is because you have a low battery. And something you might not want the drone doing when you have a low battery is flying up to a very, very high altitude. Because this means the drone is going to expend more power getting up to that high altitude, and it's going to take longer to fly back to you. Whereas if you set this to optimal, because the drone can work out that altitude it needs to rise up to automatically, and in general this altitude won't be as high as if you conservatively set it with the auto return to home preset altitude, this means the drone is going to fly back to you quicker because it doesn't spend as long rising up in the air, and it's going to use less battery getting back to you, which is more desirable. Now, another setting that you might want to change is the signal loss setting. And you can access this by again going to the settings menu and under the safety tab, scrolling down to the bottom and then going into the advanced safety settings option. Now, under the signal loss option, we have three options, return to home, descend and hover. And this will tell the drone what to do if it loses signal to your controller. So if you set this to return to home, which is the default setting, if you lose signal between the controller and drone, the drone will automatically engage return to home and fly back to you. 
but you can also set the drone to descend. So if the signal is lost to the controller, the drone will simply descend and land where it's currently at. Or if you set this to hover, when the signal is lost, the drone will simply hover in place. Now, for most flying situations, return to home will be the desirable setting. But there are some locations when you're flying where you will want to change this. So if, for example, you're flying in a forest with lots of overhanging trees and lots of branches, you probably will want to change this from return to home. And the reason for that is, if you lose signal between the controller and drone, which is more likely if you're flying in somewhere like a forest because you have lots of obstacles to create interference, the last thing you want to happen is for the drone to engage return to home, fly up to a high altitude to try and fly back to you, but fly into the branches of them overhanging trees. Instead, it would be much safer to set this to descend or hover so that if you lose signal to the drone in that forest location, that the drone will either descend and land wherever it's currently at, and so you can go and collect the drone, or set it to hover so the drone will simply hover in place, and then you can walk closer to it and regain connection. So depending on the location you are flying, you might want to change this signal loss option. Now, before we take a look at the next setting, I just wanted to say a big thanks to Wirestock who helps make these videos possible. Now, if you have ever considered trying to make a little bit of side income with your drone, then you can do that by selling the videos and images you capture as stock footage. But this can be time consuming because you have to upload each individual image and video to multiple stock agency websites. Well, this is where Wirestock comes in. Wirestock is a service which allows you to upload them images and videos to only one location and then they distribute it to all the major stock marketplaces. And instead of having to go through and fill out all the titles and descriptions for each piece of stock, Wirestock has a tool called Easy Submission to help with this. So when you upload your media to their service, they will go through and add all the metadata for you. And this just saves you so much time so that you can be out on location capturing more with your drone. They also have a super user-friendly interface where you can track all the downloads and sales for each piece of stock and see your earnings. Wirestock also automatically creates a portfolio page for you and you can use this to sell your stock directly to potential buyers by sending them the link. So if you would like to try making a little bit of side income with your drone, then why not give Wirestock a try by signing up to their platform using the link in the description down below. And the first 50 people to use the promo code DRONE will get 25% off Wirestock's premium plan. After the first 50 people use the promo code DRONE, the discount will drop down to 15%, so be sure to act fast. Now an option that you might have seen in the settings menu and didn't fully understand how it impacted the drone that you need to be cautious of is nifty mode. Now the nifty mode setting appears whenever you change your obstacle avoidance action to bypass, which is where when the drone encounters an obstacle, it simply automatically flies around it and continues on its path without you making any adjustments on the joysticks of the controller. But when you set your obstacle avoidance action to bypass, you will see a new bypassing options setting appear below. And in here you can change this between normal and nifty mode. But what does nifty mode do? Well, if you imagine an imaginary safety bubble around the drone, that whenever an obstacle touches that safety bubble, it will automatically fly around it. Whenever you change into nifty mode, that safety bubble around the drone gets reduced. And this means that the drone can fly faster, but more importantly, closer to obstacles as it's bypassing them. Or in other words, the obstacle detection sensitivity gets lowered in nifty mode. Now, the reason you want to be cautious with nifty mode is because that safety bubble gets reduced around the drone, there is a higher risk that the drone might collide with an obstacle. And in fact, whenever you change to nifty mode, you will see a warning appear, letting you know of the increased collision risk and telling you to use it with caution. So in my opinion, if you want your drone to be as safe as possible when using bypassing obstacle avoidance mode, I recommend just leaving your bypassing options always set to normal. Now, when it comes to settings, something that you should be aware of because it might ruin your day, especially after you get home and start reviewing your footage, is the fact that the resolution and FPS settings are independent to each mode. Now, I've made this mistake and I've had friends make this mistake where they set their resolution to 4K, for example, in the normal video mode, but then they start using quick shots and master shots. But when they get home and review the footage, all their quick shots and master shots were in 1080p. 
and that's because they didn't update that setting when changing into their modes because it's easy to presume that whenever you set the resolution and FPS in normal video mode, it carries over, but it doesn't. So the first time you use quick shots and master shots mode, you will want to make sure to also update the resolution and FPS. So as an example, as you can see here, my normal video mode settings are set to 4K 30 FPS. But if I change into quick shots mode now, you can see the resolution has changed to 1080p. Them settings haven't carried over. So whenever you start using the different modes of the drone, always make sure to double check your resolution and FPS so that you get the highest quality possible when using these different modes. Now, if you want to capture the highest quality images from the DJI Mini 4 Pro, then there are a few settings that you will want to change. And the first setting is the megapixel setting. Now you can access this by changing into photo mode, then going to the settings menu again, and under camera, if you scroll down, you will see a resolution setting. And in here you can see we have 12 megapixel and 48 megapixel as the options. Now, if you want to get the highest megapixel and highest quality images from the DJI Mini 4 Pro, then you will want to change this to 48 megapixel. Again, to get the highest quality images possible, you will also want to change the format setting. Now, under the format setting, you can see we have three options, JPEG, RAW, and JPEG and RAW. Now, if this is set to JPEG, you will get images that you can use straight from the drone. So after you capture an image, you won't need to edit it in any way, and you can simply take that JPEG file and upload it to social media platforms like Instagram straight away. But by changing this to RAW, you will get a few benefits. Now, raw images contain much more data and information. So this is gonna allow you more flexibility when editing your images in an image editor after the fact. But by having that extra data and information in your image, you can do a few different things. Firstly, you can boost the shadows. So if when you captured your image, you slightly underexposed it, and maybe you have an area of the image which is super dark and you can't really see any detail there, you can boost the shadows to bring that detail back. Or if you slightly overexposed your image, maybe your sky is all white, you can't see the clouds, you can recover them highlights to get a better looking sky again. And in general, a raw image which has been edited will look better than the standard JPEG images. Now you can also choose JPEG and RAW, which is my preferred setting, and you will then get the best of both worlds. When you capture an image, you will get two files saved to the micro SD card inserted into the drone. You will get that JPEG image, which is ready to go straight from the drone if you need to upload it somewhere quickly, but you will also get a raw version of that image to again have that extra data and information when editing them in your image editor. Now, when it comes to images, the last setting I recommend changing is the aspect ratio. And you will want to change this to the four x three setting. Now, the reason for this is whenever you capture an image with the four x three aspect ratio, the image will be captured with the full size of the drone's camera sensor. Now, you might want to publish your images in 16 by nine, but by capturing them in four x three, you get a few benefits. Firstly, you can always crop a 16 by nine out of a 4x3, but that 4x3 image will have extra verticality over the 16x9, and this can allow you to reframe that image after the fact. So if when you captured an image, your subject wasn't perfectly centered, that extra verticality off a 4x3 will allow you to adjust that image and reframe your subject. Secondly, because 4x3 is a slightly square aspect ratio, this can help you if you need to crop a vertical and landscape image from the same photo. Maybe you're posting a version on Instagram stories and then you're delivering a landscape version to a client. Well, because you have that extra verticality in the four x three image, this just gives you more flexibility if you're trying to get a nine by 16 vertical image from it, for example. Now, another setting that you will find under the camera subheading that I always recommend turning on and is super beneficial is the histogram option. Now, when you turn this on and go back to your camera view, you will see a new graph has appeared and this graph is your histogram. Now, a histogram is a graph that represents the tones in an image, the highlights, the shadows, and everything in between. Now, the reason why a histogram is super beneficial is because it will help you make sure your videos and images are always properly exposed. You may have encountered a scenario where it's a bright sunny day, you're struggling to see the screen clearly, 
and areas of the image might have looked perfectly fine and exposed properly, such as the sky when you were capturing your videos. But after you've come home and reviewed the footage, you realize that actually the sky was slightly too overexposed. Well, your histogram can help you avoid them scenarios. So to use the histogram, very simply, you want the majority of the graph to be in the center or spread across the center. And that's how you will know that your image is properly exposed. If your graph is majority on the right side of the histogram or completely crushed against the right side, this means your image is overexposed. It's too bright. So you will want to reduce the exposure. You can do that by lowering the exposure compensation value or by increasing the strength of the ND filter attached to the front of your camera. Now, if the graph is majority to the left side of the histogram or crushed to the left side of the histogram, this means your image is underexposed, it's too dark. So you will want to increase exposure. And again, you can do that by increasing the exposure compensation value or by lowering the strength of the ND filter attached to the drone. So you can use this as an aid to make sure you are getting properly exposed images by just making sure that that graph is in the center of the histogram. Now a setting I personally find very, very useful and I think you will too, is the grid line setting. Now you can access this under the camera subheading in the settings menu. If you scroll down, you can see the grid lines option. Now what these will do is superimpose grid lines over the camera preview you're seeing on the controller screen. And we have three options to choose from. We have this big X, we have this grid, and we have this center point. Now you can turn on each one of these individually, or you can turn on combinations of three options. Now I personally like the big X because I find this makes it much easier to keep your subject centered in your clips whenever you're doing drone moves such as an orbit. Whenever you're doing an orbit, you might have found a tendency for your subject to drift off center. But if you use this A grid line option, all you have to do is keep your subject centered under that X as you do a move around it. And this will help you make sure that your subject is always centered when you're doing drone moves. Another setting which will help you make sure you never overexpose your images is the overexposure warning setting. Now when you turn this on, the drone will overlay these zebras over any areas of the image which is overexposed. So if I tilt the camera up towards the sky, you can see some areas of the sky have this zebra pattern. And this means this area of the image is overexposed and you won't be able to recover that detail in post. So all you have to do if you see these zebras is start to decrease your exposure until they disappear. And then you will know that area of the image is not overexposed. Now to start tracking a subject, there is actually two ways you can do this. And the second way not many people know about. So the first way you can start tracking a subject is to simply draw a box over that subject and then the tracking options will appear. But there is also a second way. If you go to the settings menu under control, you will see an option called subject scanning. Now when you turn this on, the drone will automatically place these small plus icons over any subjects it recognizes it can track. And then to start tracking that subject, you simply want to press that plus icon on the subject you will see that tracking box get applied automatically and then you can select from the tracking options. So if you're looking a quick and easy way to start tracking subjects, then this is an option you might want to turn on. Now, if you have captured video clips of your drone and when you play them back or when you are editing them, they are stuttering or your computer is struggling, then a setting you will want to adjust is the coding format option. Now you can access this when in video mode under the camera setting subheading, and you can see you have two options, H.265 and H.264. Now H.265 is a newer encoding format with a better compression efficiency. And this means that the file sizes will be smaller, meaning you can capture more clips with the total storage of your micro SD card capacity. But because of that better compression efficiency, more processing power is required to encode and edit the video clips. So you will require more processing power when it comes to playing them and editing them clips. So if you have a high powered machine, a high spec computer, you will be absolutely fine using H.265 mode. Or if you have been using this mode already and you've had no issues playing back and editing the clips you have captured, then you might as well use the H.265 mode to get the benefits of that better compression efficiency. If on the other hand, you are struggling to play back the clips, your computer is struggling, it's stuttering when playing them back, maybe your video editing software is really laggy whenever you're editing them clips, then you will want to change this down to H.264. And that is because the H.264 coding format requires less processing power 
making it more efficient on older and less powerful machines. The only thing to be aware of is whenever you are using that H.264 coding format, that the file sizes will be larger. Now, another setting that you might want to change under the camera setting subheading is the style parameters. So if you scroll down until you see the style heading and press this, you can see we have an option for sharpness and noise reduction. And what these settings allow you to do is to tweak what the image looks like coming from the drone. So if you think the videos coming from the DJI Mini 4 Pro are slightly too sharp, you could decrease the sharpness to reduce the sharpness of them videos, or you could increase the sharpness by increasing this value. Or if you want to increase or decrease the noise reduction being applied to the videos, you can also increase or decrease this noise reduction slider. The last setting I recommend setting up is the button customization options. Now, if you have the DJI RC2, you have these two custom function buttons on the back of the controller. If you have the DJI RC N2, that's the controller you attach your phone to, you will have one function button on the front of the controller. And you can adjust what happens when you press these function buttons. So I recommend setting them up to functions you use all the time to save you from having to go in through various menus to access that function. And this will save you time because you then simply just need to press the button to access that feature. Now you can set these up by going to the control settings menu, scrolling down to the button customization options. And then in here, you can see we can change our actions for the C1 and C2 button. So if I press into the C1 button, you can see we can have it recenter or tilt down the gimbal, change between follow and FPV mode, turn on or off the auxiliary light, enable cruise control. If we go across to the camera subheading, you can see we can have it lock or unlock or exposure, increase or decrease exposure compensation, and simply bring up the camera settings menu when we press it. So if you want to access the cruise control function, you will want to set one of these buttons to that cruise control setting so you can then use the cruise control function. Otherwise, you simply want to set these buttons up to functions you use all the time. And this will just make you much more efficient when out flying your drone by being able to access these functions by simply pressing the buttons. So there you have it. Those are a few settings I recommend changing to make sure you get the best flying experience possible from the DJI Mini 4 Pro. Now, before you go, if you like this video and you learned something new, please let me know by giving me the thumbs up and clicking that like button down below. And if you love all things drones and want to know how to get more cinematic videos and better images from your drone, then I recommend you check out my channel where I have a ton of other content to help you level up your drone game. If you don't want to miss any of my upcoming tutorials or DJI Mini 4 Pro videos, then I recommend subscribing by clicking that subscribe button down below. And when you're down there, make sure to check that notification bell so that you will be alerted when my new videos are released. It would be greatly appreciated. And if you want to stick around and watch a few more videos now, here's a few I personally recommend. I'll not keep you back any further. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you over there.